Oh, yes, my favorite people right here in front of me. Welcome to the Embodied Woman. I'm very excited because Taylor Feldman, aka Taylor Love, is here with us. And Amber, one of my favorite people in the world, is here. As you can see, these women are absolutely fabulous and gorgeous. Natural beauties glowing from the inside. So Taylor Feldman started as a professional nanny. She actually babysat for my kids, one of the many families she worked with. And she's a family coach. She was a family coach for high profile families all over the world. Having her own daughter threw her into the deepest transformation and healing thus far as she began identifying more as a cycle breaker, focusing on inner child work and helping other moms heal to become the parents they want to be. Taylor is a singer, an incredible singer, an incredible songwriter, an actor, a model, an influencer, a photographer, incredible photographer, an author. She has a children's book out. Is it on Amazon? Mm -hmm, yes. Uh, what's it called? Good night, pup pup. Yes, that's right. Healer and so much more. And she just loves bringing her magic, true magic to women and to families to serve the world with her incredible gifts. And I'm so honored to have her here today. And so the embodied woman, you've probably just heard the embodied woman song. If you're listening to this on audio, if you're watching this on YouTube, you have not heard it yet. So I'm gonna play it and we're just gonna listen so you guys can hear it because if you're watching on YouTube, you will have not heard it before. So hopefully this works. Am I sharing? Yes, I am. And did you tell them that we're playing it because Taylor oh. wrote it? And oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't give you the background. On the, on the, so here's the background story. The background. Thank you, Amber. Thank you. Thank you. The backgrounds. I'm just too excited to play it. The background story of this song is I asked Taylor, would she write a song for the podcast, The Embodied Woman? And she was like, of course, I'm so honored and delighted to do that. And straight away, she worked her magic. I don't know how. She channeled this song. And what she did not know was that I have in my office a plaque that says, there is gold in every piece of your story. And I have another poster that is a collage that I made of women with like goddess flames in the background and when you hear the song you'll understand why it is so incredible because she didn't know this she talks about turning ashes into gold and just it's just perfect so i'm gonna play it for you guys here we go Everything I want to be, I am living out my destiny. I am, I am, I am the embodied woman. We took everything we love, we turned ashes into gold, freed ourselves from everything that kept us from being. From Welcome. Feel seen, heard, validated, support. Yes. Yes. It's Love. so good. It's so good. <sighs> I love listening to that song. 
even though I've heard it so many times, every time I listen back to the podcast, I am like, oh, I can't wait to hear this song again. And then I just hear it all the time in my head at night. Like I sing it around the house. My husband definitely knows it. (laughs) (laughs) My kids know it. The kids know it. (laughs) Yeah. I think I told you my daughter was like, you need to put that on Google. (laughs) Yes. How old is she? She just turned four. Oh, you need to put that on Google. I love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. We want you to write the full embodied woman song. And so we can put it on the podcast. So um, that's the intention of everything that I write too. I mean, I've written for other artists where I'm not as particular with the lyrics, but when it's something that I'm writing, I want it to get stuck in your head and to heal you. I want it to be like a really cool mantra that when you're singing it, because music is so powerful, everything gets stuck in our heads when it's in musical form. And what more, what a more power, what, what more powerful, (laughs) oh, I think. <clears throat> how powerful is it to have the words be so conscious so focused on like embodying who we are mm. calling that forth mm. I mean that song is just complete magic to me I just the feeling of it it just makes me feel so good as a woman in her body i'm curious when you were writing the song we're going off script here like what was your process how did how did you do it so ever since i was a kid i mean i can remember when i first started i mean i can't remember when i first started to talk but as soon as i could talk i was singing like there were just things that were coming through me I would sing, uh, we weren't a religious family, but I could sing about spirit. I could sing about the universe. Like everything that I was channeling as a kid um, was very connected to something that was that was greater than me. I would sing about God. I would sing about these things that I was not taught about in my family or um, by anybody in my life, really. So I think that that has carried throughout my entire life where whenever I even hear a song on the radio, I can hear um, any instrumental and lyrics will come to me. So when you asked, you know, I just looked at the, the title of the podcast. I knew your intention for it. And I just kind of (laughs) asked, I said, what is the song that wants to come through for this? And I was looking at some instrumentals and listening to different things. And there were, there was one that came through first and I sang that I, I recorded it. I wrote it down and I just felt like there was something more there was another verse that was meant to come through. So I sat with it for another day and kept listening to the music and stuff. And it just, I just sit with my phone and I press record on the voice memo and whatever comes out, I just sing it. And then I, and then I tailor it later. So the you tailor it, gold. tailor it, I tailor it later. <laughs> yeah. The ashes to gold was the second verse actually that came through. And when I, when I felt it, like every time you tell the story too, of what's in your office, I get chills. Cause I'm like, there's, that was not me. Like I am definitely just the channel for these, these songs that want to come out, these books that want to come out. It's really just me asking, what do you want me to sing right now? Like what needs to come through? And then I just open myself up to it and it comes out. And when you were little and you were singing about God, do you remember any of that, what you were singing? I don't. There's one um, memory that I have very vividly when I was probably like seven or eight. I have a lot of memories from when I turned eight. I started writing a lot of poems. That's when I really started writing a lot of songs. I got super into my creativity. Um And I remember I was playing handball against our garage of my childhood house, you know, and I'm playing handball. I can remember like the smell of the ball. I can remember it hitting my hand and I'm just, I was alone, but I'm getting chills now because I felt so connected. Like I felt like there was this invisible string that was connecting me to something outside, you know? And as a kid, I felt alone a lot. I mean, I have I have my, I had my parents and my two brothers, but I felt, I didn't feel connected to them. I didn't feel like I, I didn't feel like I belonged to them. So there was this overwhelming sense of connection to something else, Mm -hmm. something that 
now that I have words for it felt divine. And I just remember playing handball and having these things where I was just singing like um, something about like how great it is to be loved by something that I can't even see. Oh, wow. Wow. That's amazing. (laughs) I have a story. When I was three, my mom's brother died and I, we weren't like religious at that point. And I remember, um, I don't know if I remember this or if it was a story that I've heard, but I asked her where my uncle Jeff went. And she said, he went to be with God. Like that's, you know, and I said, where's God? Oh, wait, never mind. God is in your heart. And like, my mom has told me that story, how she never said that to me. Like they never talked about like God being in your heart. And she always thought that was such a profound thing as a small child to just have that knowing. And it's like what you're talking about, you know, that divine connection. And I also felt like I never belonged here. (laughs) I felt very alone, but um, yeah, so I I can relate with that. I also felt like I didn't belong. When I turned 10, both sets of parents had new children. And so Mm -hmm. I would have these nightmares that I was in the hall and like didn't know what room to go into because they each had their own families now. And I was just like, oh. in the, you know, so I, I relate. Mm. Kids are very connected too. I mean, like, that's so cool that as a three-year-old, and I love that you said, I don't know if I actually remember this or it's because it's been told to me. I have a few of those too. But mm. even my daughter, she said something similar about God where I was, I was writing I was having some some moments, you know, and I was writing it out, asking asking God for help with this situation. And she goes, Mama, what are you writing? And I said, well, I'm having, you know, I'm having some feelings. I'm having some issues with something. I'm just asking. I'm writing for help. You know, she goes, what's it about? And I said, you know, it's adult stuff, but it's going to be all taken care of. I'm just asking. And she goes, well, let me ask my God because my God's here. And she, she goes, I'm going to call my God in. And she goes, she asks, and she said, you know, she gives me this profound advice to that. Um, I forgot exactly what I told her the part of the issue, because I'll try to tell her in, a, in age appropriate things what's going on. You know, oh, I said, when I'm feeling really upset, I don't want to be around this person. But I know that's not true. That's not my true feeling about it. It's just like me being hurt and I'm not able to be kind in that situation. And I want to be kind no matter how I'm feeling because this person, I love this person and care about them and they do with me as well. And so she said, so my God said um, that you can be around anyone and be kind. (laughs) And I said, thanks baby. And then she goes, now let's ask your God. (laughs) And she goes, I'm going to call your God. And I've not, we've not done this kind of practice before. You know, I've never done this before, but Kids are really, really powerful and connected when we when we let them tap into those kinds of things. Can I just say that last night, Bodhi, when I was putting him to bed, he said, Mommy, what was the who was the first Buddha? Tell me how Buddhism started. Mm. And and he was asking me all these questions and he was like, Are you a boot like, are you enlightened? What's enlightenment? And I said, do you think I'm enlightened? And he goes, yeah, because you guys chant a lot. It was just this incredible conversation. Kids are amazing. They really are. They are. We are all born. I mean, that's, you know, the mission that I have felt since I was a kid. And I think it's because I felt so disconnected from my own family and so not seen or tended to emotionally, relationally, spiritually, like, yes, I was provided for physically. I think a lot of us can identify with being physically, like our physical needs were met, but everything else was kind of like, you're fine, you know, and they they didn't know how to deal with a lot of other aspects of who we are, especially as sensitive beings, light workers, healers, whatever, these children that come in with so much love and so, so much energy and just so much brightness, I think, um, that I, I started very young and if there was a baby around, I would be with that baby. If there was a kid around, I would be with that baby. And I just felt this sense of, I'm going to give them what I'm not getting. Mm -hmm. And that has carried Mm -hmm. through like my entire life of just, I want the home to feel so safe. And it is our first 
it's our first school. It's how we learn about relationships. It's how we learn about ourselves. It's how we learn about all of the world, you know? And it's, it's, I mean, having my own daughter showed me how hard it can be <laughs> when you're not raised in an environment that is so naturally caring and tending to you in emotional ways and spiritual ways. And when we don't have the skills ourselves, when our default mode is not connection and when our default mode is not let me see what your need is and meet it, you know, when our default mode is reaction and survival and how am I going to, you know, how does this making me feel as the adult? Um, when we're, when we're able to kind of switch into a different mode, that's more, oh, I am the adult and I do have the power here to walk my child through this difficult feeling or teach them how to regulate themselves by co-regulating with them instead of making them go into their room by themselves and figure it out. You know, there's a lot of different, a lot of different ways that we can show up and heal the home, which will just trickle out and heal the world. Yeah, I want to hear more about the cycle breaker and like, because that's what you, you're you talking about. Mm -hmm. So How for me, yeah, for being a, so being a cycle breaker, I mean, as a nanny, I did things differently. You know, I was very, I didn't know the gentle parenting world or respectful parenting, but I was very, that was my mode. Um, I really embodied someone who as an adult was still very respectful with children was still very present with them helped them manage their emotions helped them communicate um super patient you know very like i thought <laughs> i thought i was going to be the most amazing parent if i ever became one because mm -hmm. of how i was as a nanny and as a family coach seeing <clears throat> excuse me seeing how you know seeing how parents were reacting and from an outsider's perspective, I was like, oh, why are you reacting like that? You know, like, you don't have to do that. You can just be like this, like, just be like I am. Little did I know, number one, that when you have a kid, like all of your childhood stuff will be shown to you. Your children are going to mirror so much and bring up so much for you that I wasn't aware of. Um, and also, like, I got to sleep, you know, I was getting paid, I could go home, I could quit, like, there was so many things that I was so unaware of, everything was provided, you know, the family took care of everything. So there were a lot of things that I was, um, was unaware of until it was my own child. So once I had my daughter, I realized, because how I would snap into the default of what my parents, how my parents raised me. Um, which was so terrifying. I felt so powerless. I was like, how do I know how to, I want to respond? How have I helped parent and raise all of these other children that are not mine? And with my own baby, like here I am snapping and re reacting and, um, not able to hold the space for her. Like I would another child, you know? Um, and then I started to realize that it's because <laughs> of, how like from zero to seven or eight we're in this state of basically hip we're be, basically being hypnotized you know so like whatever is going on in our environment as a child we're just accepting it as truth and so from zero to seven that was my blueprint you know whatever my parents did to me that was like the blueprint for how a parent should react to a child a cycle breaker is someone that says, okay, that is a cycle that I'm going to break, obviously. And for me, it was a bunch of parenting stuff and relationship stuff. Like when I was very young, I can remember making a vow to myself that I later had to undo because it was such a powerful vow that I made that I would never get married. I would never be in love. I said, I looked at my parents and I said, that looks way too painful. Like, I do not want that. I will never sign up for that. And that really, I stuck with that for a really long time until I realized that's not my truth. I want to be in relationship. I want a healthy relationship. And I just wasn't modeled that. But that just because my parents didn't have that doesn't mean it's not possible. And doesn't mean it's not possible for me. So that I'm breaking the cycles of relationship, of marriage, of like what a husband and wife is, and also what a mom and a dad is. Because the parenting cycle breaker, which a lot of people can identify with, of like, I was not raised... I want to raise my children in a different way than I was raised. And I want to be, I want to have a romantic relationship. I want to have a partnership that was different than what my parents had. 
and it takes a lot. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. I was going to say, yeah, like you, I mean, clearly like we, we know a little bit about what your childhood was like from, you've painted kind of that picture so we can kind of get a sense of that. And then where you're at now, like something happened, some catalyst, some experience, like what would you say there's like one experience that you had that you were never the same after that, that put you on this trajectory that kind of woke you up to new possibilities. So I think one of the biggest ones was, was choosing to not be with my daughter's father. I mean, that was a huge step that I had to take um, where, you know, when I first got pregnant, I knew we were not going to be together. I knew that was not my person. Like I did not, you know, things happened very quickly and we were not good. And I really, we tried, you know, we, we stuck in the relationship, but throughout my pregnancy, things were really bad to not get better. And then when I had her, I remember this is probably the moment where I was like, something needs to change because I remember she's tiny, you know, I'm sleep deprived hormones, my partner sleeping out in the other room. I'm alone with her all the time. You know, like I feel emotional thinking about it because of how much pain I was in at the time, you know? And I just remember like holding her thinking I'm going to pump enough milk. Like once I get enough milk for her to last a year, I'm going to go like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to either I'm going to die or I'm going to leave. Like I remember. And after thinking that I was like, Oh my God, something's really wrong. You know, I, I cannot believe that I'm thinking, I mean, how motherly to think about preparing her for a year to have, you know, to have the, the milk for a year. But I mean, I was like, wow, I'm in so much pain right now that I'm thinking about not being here, you know? Um, so I, in that moment was like, okay, if things do not change, like if I don't feel better about this situation in a month, I think I gave myself one month. I'm like, then we're, I'm going to make a different, we're not going to be together, you know? Um, and we did, I mean, we did still, we tried, we kept trying, but knowing that that's where I was in the relationship and as a mom um, woke me up. And from there, I started to do some inner child work. I really went back into my own childhood and I started to like divine, you know, reparent myself. I started to really get, get clear on what it is that I wanted um, in terms of a relationship, in terms of who I wanted to be as a mom. And I mean, to be honest, it was super overwhelming because I felt so far from it. I felt so far from it. I was like, this is, you know. And you also had a Facebook group for moms or for women that was a lot of women that you were leading. Yeah, Yeah, I was leading and I really (laughs) stopped. I mean, I really dropped off a lot, but yeah, I had, I I still have a Facebook group. I'm, you know, I'm not super active in it anymore, but the, the group is still there. The women are still there, but yeah, I was leading that. I was doing lives every week. I was welcoming women to showcase their talents, you know, and introduce them to the group. It was all about advice and recommendations. So sharing, um, you know, it was like your neighborhood hotline, basically, you know, like, Oh, I need this kind of person. I need this, or I'm going through this situation. And, you know, then, then the group could, could connect whoever needed to be connected. Um, I was doing that. I was launching my own motherhood coaching um, program. I was writing uh, a bonding before birth journal. So for for women that are pregnant to start to connect to the baby, connect to their vision of motherhood, to start to work through this stuff (laughs) um, before the baby comes, you know, so you're not like... (laughs) actively parenting and figuring all that out while also healing all of your childhood trauma. Um, so yeah, I was really working. I was really working on a lot. Um, and then, yeah, then I just hit a point where I was like, I, I need to get out of the situation. I really need to take care of myself. And, um, because I, I could see where I was starting to go, <laughs> which was just down, just down and down and down. And so I'm like, if I want to heal, I mean, it was my daughter, you know, I literally was like my whole life. I've, I've been able to be spiritual. I've been able to do the work at my own pace. You know, if I got into a relationship where 
I was triggered and there were things that were coming up that I didn't really want to look at. I was like, you know, this isn't the relationship for me, (laughs) you know, like it's just, isn't it? And I could leave, you know, but having a child, I was like, I'm not willing to, to mess her up, you know, like, I know I'm going to make mistakes obviously, but I'm not willing to just be who I am right now. I, I, I wanted to heal for myself, of course, because I, as I've been realizing lately, like I did not know how low my self-esteem was and my self-worth was and how much I didn't really, I didn't really believe that I was worthy of love or success or happiness. You know, I didn't really, and I wasn't aware of that until really recently where I started listening to these I am worthy affirmations. And I was like, I don't believe any of that. That's so sad that I've spent most of my life, you know, really insecure, really pushing these things away, really not feeling like I can just be myself and that I would be okay. And I thought, I don't want my daughter to grow up with this. You know, I wish that I would have had at least some of a different experience growing. I know that we all have the experience that we're supposed to have because it makes us who we are and we're supposed to go all through all these things. But I look at this little baby, you know, that I have and I'm like, I'm gonna heal. I'm gonna heal this. It's not gonna be perfect. It's gonna be crunchy. Like I, I'm still not perfect, you know. She she's so grateful though at four. She's so you know, because I, I apologize. Like there's so many things as a cycle breaker, you know, that I do so differently. I, I apologize to my daughter. I repair when, when I mess up, we talk about things. She's allowed to tell me exactly how she feels. She tells me all the time, you know, how much she'd rather be with her dad, how all these things. And I know she says, she goes, I say the same thing when I'm with dad, you know? And I'm like, but as a parent, you know, I'm able to just go, okay, you're allowed to feel that way right now. You know, like, I'm not going to give her a guilt trip back. I'm not going to have this whole tantrum because she's saying something that I could take personally, or I could take whatever I'm really practicing. And I mean, the biggest thing that I've been working on is just the emotional regulation and nervous system regulation, because I didn't again, realize how, how much I let my emotions throw me from one way to the other and how sensitive I was how I took everything personal the stories in my mind would are just just mean they're baseline mean like if something happens my initial thought is like I I suck they hate me they're gonna leave you know this is not working it's just it's just like the worst case scenario you know so I'm catching all these things because I'm like where how sad to live your life with that kind of with that kind of baseline, you know, with that default mode of just, I'm not enough and things are never going to be okay. <laughs> and, and it's pretty much across the board on some level, every man and woman has that I'm not enough belief. I'm curious if since becoming a mom and seeing how hard it is, you've been able to forgive your mom on a deeper level. Absolutely. My mom and my dad, because I, I made my dad the hero. I really, he was my best friend. You know, I really made him, I, I, he could do no wrong. Right. (laughs) Dad, he's my dad. You know, and that's honestly one reason I, I mean, there was a moment in my, in our co-parenting, whatever process when we were separating where things were really bad and I could have turn the story into like worst case scenario. I could have called the cops. You know, he could have gone to jail. He, we could, I could, she could, my daughter could have never seen him again. You know, I could have really taken that drama and ran with it and made it like blown it up into something that it it wasn't yet could have been probably if we kept going at the rate we were, but I, I thought about my own dad and my relationship with him and how much he really did like save me throughout my life. You know, just having the, having that, that person that got me, that celebrated me, that I knew I could count on, you know, that really was probably one of the only one, I mean, the only one in my family for sure that, that appreciated who I was, you know, I mean, with all the other stuff, yes, that I got to see later on, but having that person in my life and having it be my dad, I mean, has been one of my biggest blessings. So I thought about that. And I was like, you know what, how am I going to take away her dad from her? You know, if thing, if when she's grown up, And if she decides that she does not want to have a relationship with him, that's on her. You know, I'm not going to be the person that stands in the way of that. I'm not going to be the one. 
So I put my, my little ego and plus the relationship again, from, from a child's perspective, I remember looking at my mom and my dad, their relationship was horrible. You know, the way they treated each other was awful, but the way that they treated us was different, you know? So I was able to acknowledge that the relationship, the personal relationship that I had with her dad is going to be different forever than the relationship that he, that they have with each other. Um, but yeah, so I, I made my mom the scapegoat of everything. I really just, and she, you know, I mean, there is, she, <laughs> I accept who she is now and I don't expect anything different from her, um, which I think is one of the biggest ways that I'm able to have her in my life, you know, and able to just be her daughter <laughs> mm. um, and just be a human being, not even be her daughter, honestly, because I feel like when I have that daughter hat on I still have expectations of her as a mother yes that society has that I've yes. been able to go like oh my god just becoming a mom doesn't heal you you know you don't become this perfect saint of a person just because you're a mom you're like we're still a human being <laughs> and seeing that in my own relationship where I had my daughter and I was like oh my gosh I'm still me you know like there's really unless I do the work nothing's going to change and so I mean, li we had to live, we lived with my mom too, uh, with my daughter for almost a year. And that was so challenging on so many levels, but it was necessary too. Like we really, we were so raw, so honest with each other. We were able to talk about a lot. We were able to say like, this hurt me and I I'm not okay with this. And if we want to have a relationship, like this is not okay with me. And this is the way that it, you know, we were able to set boundaries. We were able to really clear a lot. And I got to see her for, you know, she really is authentic. I mean, she is just herself. She can, and, and I really appreciate that about her. I really appreciate that about her. And I was able to see that I had expectations of her as a mom. She had expectations of me as a daughter that I didn't mm. meet either, which was really hard to hear. Because <laughs> wow. I'm also like, I, I was the kid, you know, like, yeah. I was the kid, so. Um, and then, yeah, through that, then we lived with my dad and his wife. And then I was able to see a lot of things about my dad that I was like, oh, I got some stuff from you too, you know, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of things that hurt me too. And there are some things I'm not okay with too in this relationship. And I felt almost, you know, I felt really bad in a way that, because my whole family scapegoats my mom like it's not just me it's a fam it's a family thing like she's mm -hmm. this she's that if she mm -hmm. wasn't that if she could just do this and everything would have been fine <laughs> yeah you know and I'm looking at the other side of it and I'm like not totally true right yeah but I have forgiven her becoming a mom for sure and becoming a mom also gave me a lot of compassion and understanding for all of the families that I worked for like all of the families that I worked for as a nanny and all the families that I worked with as a coach, you know, because I have this whole other perspective now and this whole other experience. Like I have the experience now of what it truly is like to have the responsibility of a child, not only just like the physical needs being met, but all, all of the other things that you have to think about and do as a parent. Mm -hmm. So Amber, what are you well, curious? Yeah. I mean, I'm going to yeah, let I you. There's I so was much. I going to say there's there's so much. First of all, I just want to acknowledge you because um, my kids are nine and eleven, but I went through a divorce when they were five and seven, and I had a similar feeling. Like I woke up and I said, "Oh my god, I I can't model this for my kids," like this can't be what they grow up thinking is healthy love. This can't be, you know, and like, similarly to you, I, I didn't realize how, how low my self-esteem was to uh, be in something that wasn't, you know, wasn't fulfilling me in a way that, you know, that I think the healthy marriage that I want to be in, um, did, but it took me seeing my children. Like I couldn't do it for myself. You know, I couldn't like make that choice for myself, but when I saw that it would be damaging them more 
you know, for the longest time, I didn't want to leave my marriage because I was afraid it would ruin their lives leaving by leaving. And then all of a sudden I saw some things happening with their behavior that I went, Oh my God, I'm actually going to do more damage by staying. And so I just want to honor you because it takes a lot of courage to be the cycle breaker and to be willing to, you know, to be true to yourself, even when, you know, it's really hard and you have to go live with your parents again, which I, I also had that experience. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. And I also, um, it was really helpful for me to hear you say that your relationship with him is one thing, but his relationship with your daughter is another thing. Um, yeah, because I have a very different co uh, parenting style than their dad. Mine is very similar to the one that you were describing. And his is very similar to the one that you described in the beginning. <laughs> very, uh, you know, just reactive. And um, they're the kids, I'm the parent, you know, and I, I see it differently. So, you know, learning how to co-parent with someone who has a very different style and philosophy is, um, is a challenge that I live with every single day. But, um, you know, I think that's why we are doing this podcast is because we can be, you know, hopefully examples of embodied women who are still experiencing challenges, you know, and walking through it bravely and um, modeling for our children, even in the toughest times, you know, so uh, thank you. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Well said, Amber. What yeah. does it, what does an embodied woman, Taylor, mean to you? An embodied woman to me is a woman <clears throat> that feels full of her, of her truth, you mm. know, feeling full of her own essence and being able to, like, it feels solid, you know, like you're anchored in and which means that you have space to experience other people's truth, mm -hmm. mm. other people's experiences, you know, it's just like, okay, mm. yes, I'm in mine yes. and whatever is going on with you is not going to sway mine. You know, like I am who I am and I'm open to this, but if there's something outside that's like, you're able, you're able to filter, you're able to filter things. It's not, everything's flying at you and you have no control over what you respond to or how you react or whatever. You're solid in yourself and you're able to filter through what you want to bring in and what you want to keep out. I love that. I love how every woman we ask this question and they give the most brilliant answer. Yeah. And you're just like, that's even better than that. I mean, they're all <laughs> perfect. They're all perfect. Yeah. But it's so beautiful. These answers like, oh, yeah, I love that so much. That has just given me such a gift, like an image of that I can carry with me. I love mm -hmm. that. I just love it. And you know, the thing is, is that like what you just said, you know, like truly knowing who you are and, and really being centered in that um, is something that as an embodied woman, we can, we can always return to like life might be throwing all kinds of things at us and it might feel really overwhelming, but nobody can take that away from us. Like, I know who I am and I know, you know, that I am embodied and that I love myself in a way that I never have before. I know what that means. I know what that feels like to love myself today. And, you know, that's like one thing that I can hold on to when I'm mm -hmm. feeling overwhelmed with life and feeling, you know, uncertainty and fear like okay this is one thing i can hold on to i know who i am and i love myself and everything else i don't know but at least i can come from that place 
Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's anchoring it in our bodies because these thought forms and all the things that we are, you know, the energetics of everything, it's really like bringing it in and anchoring it into our physical bodies because having that baseline belief of I'm lovable, I'm enough, I'm worthy, I know I'm a good person. When we have that within our body, within our physical being, and we are truly grounded and connected to that, then everything else that happens won't sway us, you know, won't, won't, won't be able to take that away from us. Like you're saying, it's something you can always come back to. It's like when, when a situation outside of us happens, like, um, somebody cuts us off in traffic, for instance, like a very common example. If we don't have the embodied, if we don't have that embodied into us, like of I'm, I'm a good person. Things always work out for me. Like I'm lovable. I'm enough. We can interpret those external situations as something about who we are mm-hmm. when it has nothing to do with who we are, you know? Mm-hmm. So if we maintain that sense of the baseline of us being good, of us being worthy, of us being lovable and that we love ourselves, then no matter what's happening outside, we're going to, we're going to be okay. What are the embodiment practices that have given you or that continue, I should say, to give you that baseline? That anchor it in. Yeah. For me, a lot of it has been well, two things. I would say thought work, like really catching what my mind is saying about myself and about other people and about the situation. Like, wow, that's kind of a crazy story (laughs) that we don't have to believe. And that might not even be true. So I have, for me, my mind is very active. I can see all sides of the situation. I can see all different kinds of things. I'm very good at helping other people reframe things, see things in a positive way, um, come up with affirmations. Like I do custom affirmations for people. I'm very good, obviously in channeling songs. Like I'm really good at for other people, but I had to go, okay, let's do this for me. Yes. Let me catch my own thoughts and reframe that and, and really pay attention to the stories that were going on um, and the loops that were happening. Um, and then the other ones, energy work for sure, like, and breath work, regulating the nervous system, but energy practices like, um, I mean, Reiki, you've helped a lot with the, with Reiki uh, and um It's the inner child work and the divine reparenting. I'm trying to decide like which one probably helped the most, but both of them, like going into my childhood, Mm -hmm. really seeing myself as a little girl and giving her, like spending time with myself as a little kid and, and anchoring her in my heart or in my body and saying, Hey, I'm a safe adult now. Like you're safe. You know, I'm a safe adult and I'm here and I'm going to take care of you. Like I'm going to meet your needs. I've got you. And anytime, you know, that little child comes up where I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel like a toddler right now. Like I really feel activated. Like I'm a little kid. I will drop into that and I will go to her and I'll, and I'll be like, I'm here. I'm here and we're safe. I've got you. I am your parent now. I'm your mom now, (laughs) you know, like, um, those things, the divine reparenting was really powerful too, of actually visualizing and getting to know what a divine mother would be, what a divine father would be, and to call them in to help parent me, to Mm -hmm. help, to, to know that I have these like divine parents that are watching over me, that are giving me the skills that are keeping me safe and protecting me, that are only providing amazing opportunities that are going to help my soul and help the world. You know, those things absolutely have helped yoga has always helped too. like getting into my body if I'm feeling like I need to move something then I will drop in and just do some stretching and kind of like feel where it is in my body and and move it out I would and tapping tapping has helped too Mm. and especially when the thought comes the thought forms come the stories come and I'm just like wow I need this out of me you know like it's just stored somewhere in my cells because it keeps coming up and so I'll just tap it out Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. So when you feel the most embodied, is that also when you're singing? I would say, yeah. And it's funny because I've had so much insecurity around singing too. Like I've sang my entire life. I've been in theater. I've had so many opportunities to, to 
to make the singing part of my life bigger. And I have continued to push it away, <laughs> you know, um, to just push it away. And now I'm finally like, I'm ready. I really want this. You know, it's it's been a, I have seen the same dream. I have had the same gifts and the same desires since I was teeny tiny. I'm like, when am I going to just let this happen for myself? You know, like, obviously, if it's in your heart, it's in your mind, it doesn't go away. It's meant for you. You know, and I think this worthiness part of it and, and the insecurity part of it and even just grounding myself into who I am and, and accepting who I am, saying like, this is what I want, acknowledging, even allowing myself to want that, yes. you know, because it's kind of a different, not everybody's going to be a singer. Not everybody's going to be an actor. Not everybody's going to be like, there are certain things that society is like, well, that's only for a certain kind of person or a little, you know, like that's not for everybody. That's kind of a wh whatever. And I'm like, okay, but that's on my heart, you know, and that's something that has had has been a theme my entire life, no matter what's going on, there's always opportunities for me to sing for me to write. Um, but what I was, why I was starting to say that is because it has had this insecurity kind of around it and this doubt or this disbelief that that is what I'm supposed to be doing. So sometimes when I'm singing, I can get out, I'm not embodied because I can get out of it. The, the, the thoughts kind of come mm. in of like, you're not good enough. Like you're not a good singer or you really don't write that well or what, you know, these thoughts have come out that kind of take me out of it. But when I, I mean, there was a, a moment the other day, uh, maybe a month or two now in the studio where we made a song because we're working on new music. It's more electronic. It's kind of fun and dancey and stuff, but still like, you know, still good lyrics to get caught in your mind. Um, and, you know, the producer comes in and he's just like, it's just not feeling right. You know, he's like, I don't know something about it. It's just not feeling right. Like maybe we just give it to someone else. Whoa. And, yeah. He's like, maybe we just, not, not in a mean way, you know, not in like a threatening way, but he was like, you know, no worries. Maybe we just try somebody else, you know? And, and my, the, my, oh. my friend and I, you know, the one that we're working on the music together, he's a DJ, he's amazing. He does so many things. Um, we kind of look at each other and we're like, give us a minute, just give us, give us a minute. Like, you know, just let us sit with it for a second. We literally like in 15 minutes wrote a new thing. I sang it. I put it out there. He comes in and he was like, that's it. That's wow. it. And so moments, moments like that. I'm like, I'm meant to do this. Oh. I am meant to do this. It was a confirmation. Yeah. I got chills. It was a confirmation. So yes, singing, I love that. writing for sure. I feel like I'm just directly channeling from something and it feels, I feel that connection and I feel like this is, this is what I'm here for. You know, this is, this is part of me that I'm here to express. It's that such trust, a right. That trust, like in that moment, yes. you could, you could have said, so I was just going to say, okay, like, yes. like give it to somebody else, but you have cultivated enough trust in yourself that you're like, no, no, like I am, this is what I am meant for. Like, I love that so much. And we always, like, we always have those moments where we can, you know, give up on ourselves or we can like hold the trust in who we are and why we're here. That's incredible. I love that. And then you found Thank your you. gold. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Amazing. I was literally going to say exactly what you said, Amber. Yes. Yes to that because mm -hmm. more of those moments that you just have under your belt of like, well, actually I'm, I'm not, I can easily walk away and just use this as like a reinforcement of my shadow aspect beliefs, or I could use this as a moment to double down on who I know I truly am mm -hmm. and like, keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank I didn't you even, that. you're right. And it's, with, with that particular aspect of my life, I feel like I've gotten more confident in that. So it's a little bit easier for me to go. And also I feel super comfortable with who I'm working with now. Like I really have good people with me, you know? So I'm like, you know, there was no fear really. I was like, what's the, you know, let me try again and, and we'll see what happens. Like, no, it's fine either way. I will say in my relate in intimate relationship, like in my partnership and in parenting, the moments are getting are getting easier, like more second nature to go, you know, let's try that again, you know, quick, more, more mm -hmm. quickly. Um, but those are the, those are the areas that I'm really looking to grow in now because I will still get triggered and want to go, you know, and the default story of like, 
whatever, like, I'm not, I, I can't do this. I'm not good at this. This is not for me, whatever will still come up. And I, and just over the past month, I would say, I have seen myself show up very powerfully of like, no, this is not the story. This is not my story. What I see from my life, the parent that I see from of who I am, the wife that I see for who I want to be, like, I'm going to embody that. I'm going to try that hat on and I'm only going to let that be my story. Like I'm not available for the other stuff anymore. Beautiful. <laughs> That's very inspiring. And there are those moments where I am not a good mom. But I've had moments recently where I've said to Amber, they flipped out, they were fighting. I did, and I just, I was calm. I didn't react. I just sat them separately. I had lots of conversations. I was so proud of myself and I was proud of them and they love it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And just so you were like not being a good mom, I feel like is something that we say, but we're, you're always a good mom. You yeah. Know? You're always a good mom. The fact that you even felt the way that you felt about it, it means that you were a good mom. The, the fact that you're doing the work that you are aware of it. I understand what you mean. You're not your, you weren't your ideal version of yourself as a mother in that moment, but you were still a good mom because you were still showing up. You were still present and showing kids that we are human. Like, I yes. feel like that was something that our gen, the generation before, or a lot of parents before did not, they were not comfortable doing, you know, it's, I'm the parent, I'm the adult and that's it. It's Period. not like I'm a human too. I yeah. mess up too. I'm not perfect. I get stressed. I'm impatient. You know, like I'm just learning and growing with you as well. But I just wanted to anchor that in that you're always a good mom. You just weren't yeah. showing up as the ideal, you know, perfect parent that you have in your mind. <laughs> Yes. I was going to say the it's same, same thing. I was gonna say the same thing. Yeah. Cause my, I, I have those conversations with my kid and my son will literally say, cause I, I have, this is the language I use with them. Like I wasn't my best self in that moment. Yeah. Like, you know, we all are going to have moments. I'm going to let you guys finish this conversation. Cause I have to go hop off and, um, I have a call with my publisher for my book that's coming out in January. So, Yay. um, back to back, but Taylor, you're incredible. You're amazing. Your song is a gift that I did not expect. Like when I, when this whole podcast thing came about, I mean, it's, it's exceeding my expectations in the most wonderful way. And your song is a huge part of that. So thank you for that. Yeah. I love you both. And love you. Mwah, mwah. Love you. Love Have you a too. great Have meeting. A thank you. We're excited for her book. So, so um, We, we kind of covered the other questions, like the tools that help you move back into alignment you talked about. Um, we might not have covered this question, which is a recent experience where you noticed yourself acting from your wounded self and then navigated your way back to your most embodied knowing. Well... There's, I mean, there's a couple that come to mind. <laughs> I'm, I'm deciding if I want to share the partnership one or the parenting one. Um, because parenting, I mean, that happens at least, you know, once or twice a week still. <laughs> Where yeah. I will, you know, my daughter is having her feelings and everything in me wants to shut it down. And it's just like, this is not okay. I'm not okay with this. You know, this is all the things from, from society, from my childhood, whatever comes into it. And I feel it in my body and I just want to explode. And lately what I've been doing is like, I just say it out loud. I'm feeling really, I'm feeling really activated right now. I'm feeling really stressed or I'm feeling whatever. Um, and I'm going to breathe. If you want to breathe with me, you can. Usually she's like, no, <laughs> you know, she's like, I'm like, I'm going to breathe because yeah. I need to breathe, you know? Yes. Um, and so I will, I'll tap in or I literally just take, just take some space. I'm like, I need, I need some space for a second, you know, and I will go and I will collect myself. I'll, I have looked myself in the mirror and said, get it together. <laughs> like, get it together. You're the adult. You're the mom here. You know, like this is your chance to show up. Mm -hmm. 
and I will pep talk myself and kind of just tough love it of like, Hey, you can do this. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. this is, this is your chance Mm -hmm. to show up for her and to show up for yourself because how crappy do we feel after like, we don't show up as our best selves, you know, with our children, especially it's like, yeah. So, um, that's one thing in parenting, um, in my partnership, we were playing out this old kind of drama cycle and this happened the other day and I'm so, so optimistic that this was just the final, the final, the final, whatever of it, the final blow. Um, because we had, you know, a similar dynamic where there was drama. We were, we were totally coming from our wounds. Like I could see he was acting from his hurt. I was acting from my hurt. And it's from this belief that you don't really love me and you're going to leave me, you know? And so when we're in that state, like we are testing and we're pushing and we're just screaming, like, please show me that you love me. And please show me that you're not going to leave me. And so I was, as we're doing it, I stayed so calm and I was just like in my mind going, this is not the story. Like, this is not what I'm not, I'm not available for this anymore. Like in my mind, I was like, this is, I'm not, I just kept repeating. I'm not available for this story. Like, I'm not going to participate in this anymore. And I said something like that, where I said, this is it. Like, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I'm so sorry for anything that I've brought into this. Like that was my, you know, my addition to this, but I'm not going to do it anymore. And he, he asked, you know, to, to have some space to go out for a second. So of course I said, fine, go. And everything in me wanted to leave. I just wanted to leave. I just wanted to go get away, escape. But that's like not, that's not what I really wanted to do, right? And that's also playing out the story that you are going to leave, you know, like mm-hmm. it's playing into that version of it. Mm-hmm. So all, so I sat myself down and I put my hands like on my heart and on my belly and I breathed and I just said, this is not the story. The truth of this is, and I just reminded myself of the truth. And I said, no matter what happens right now, I'm safe. I'm lovable. And I'm I'm going to just sit here. I'm just going to sit here, you know? And I just sat with myself and I made myself feel safe. And with, and it looked took maybe three minutes of doing that. And he came in and was just like sat and was so present with me and was like, I'm so sorry that, you know, I, I thought I, whatever. And we just repaired. And it was like the fastest, you know, and I just said, yeah this is the way that it goes, you know, like this is, I'm anchoring this in now. That's beautiful because Mm -hmm. there's so many people that don't know how to do that. And it's that practice that you were able to do it so quickly is because you've practiced and all of the work that you've done on yourself, you were able to employ quickly in that moment. Yeah. And I I was able to see it. I was just able to see it from a different perspective. Like I really, you know, there's a lot of relationship advice right now out there about like masculine and feminine. And if you want a masculine man, and if you want to be in your feminine, you have to do this and don't do this. And I was really letting all of that, like, um, not, I wasn't being my authentic self because I was trying to kind of do these to get this kind of relationship and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I've been dismantling a lot of that, but I was able to, to be in that moment And I mean, this happened actually multiple times over the last week or two, which I think allowed me to cultivate it and do it so quickly in that moment is because I was able to have space from it. I was like, this isn't, this isn't happening to me. Like I can pull myself out. I Mm. see that he's coming from hurt. I see that I'm coming from hurt, but that's not the, that's not the truth. You know, I mean, it is partly true, but we can heal. We can heal together. We don't have to keep activating those wounds and hurting them more, which is what I've done in previous relationships or just maybe just last one. Um, But I was able to just go, okay, this isn't, this doesn't have to be like, it doesn't have to go that way. And I think last week, something similar happened where I did leave, but I just went out to my car because I have left before, but I went out to my car and I just sat and I just cried and I just Mm -hmm. tapped and I took deep breaths. And I said, how do you want this to go? Mm -hmm. How do you want this? I asked myself, like, how do you want your relationship to go? How do you want to show up here? Mm -hmm. You know, do you like, what do you really want? And I got very clear. And I was like, the kind of person that I would be, would be to repair this. I would go back in there, you know, and I would not prolong it. We're not going to drag this out for days or a day or hours or whatever. Like, it's just, unnecessary you know and if I'm not available for the drama 
if I don't want pain anymore <laughs> or to create more pain and drag it on, then I have, I have the ability to, and I think that's where the emotional regulation and emotional maturity comes in is going, I can have feelings about this too. You know, like I'm not, I, I can be unhappy or I can feel hurt by things as well while also being able to see that the other person is hurting, the other person's having a hard time. And if I love and care, if I love them and care about them and want a relationship with them, just like I would want for them, if they were the more regulated one in the situation to be able to hold and co-regulate me, like Mm. I can do that for my partner. I can do that for my child. I can do that for my friends, Mm. you know? Um, But it kind of goes back to the expectation of people in certain roles like the expectation of what a mother should be able to do, the expectation of a father, the expectation of a husband, the expectation of a daughter, the expectations often um, create so much more pain and drama and disconnect. Um, when we can, I'm like, okay, if there was just a friend, how would I feel? You know, if this was somebody that w- I would not have that yes. crazy expectation on them. You know, yep. I would be able to come in a much different way. You could just see them for them as a human, as opposed to seeing them through the filter of all of these expectations and ideas of what things should be. Just like you said, yeah, that's, I mean, these are such deep, wise truths that I feel like you need to continue to write more books and speak do more speaking about all of this because family systems and nervous system regulation and coping, you know, in a healthy way and just that ability to like zoom out and not be in the story, but have the awareness and consciousness to choose to opt out of the story in those moments where it's the hardest. That's a deep skill that you're employing and A lot of people don't know how to employ that. And I think it's needed, incredibly, incredibly needed because these things that you're sharing so vulnerably and authentically that not a lot of people are willing to share, we all experience, we all go through this. Everything you're talking about, okay, maybe not every single little detail, like exactly, but like we all have something we can relate to in your story. So we need, we need more embodied, you know, nervous system regulated, like all these tools that you're using. Um, we need to all be learning how to employ them more. And, and um, you're a living example of someone who isn't trying to show and say, I'm perfect and I know how to do everything and I've got it all figured out. You're like, here's the mess of my struggles here's where i'm winning in life and like come with me and and let's do this together oh yeah i mean having mentors having somebody to hold your hand having examples of you know starting from an imperfect place starting from a place that i really did not want to be in at all and thinking how how am i going to get from here to there i mean it's taken you know my daughter's almost my daughter just turned 4 so i would say a good 4 years of first becoming really aware of what was my stuff cuz for a long time i was just like it's not me <laughs> like i mean i know it's me it's of course me a little bit but it's mostly them yeah. you know and it's mostly that then going okay because um separating from her dad and being a single mom and really just being her and I I was like oh all the same stuff is still coming up for me and it's just me and her and it's not her (laughs) like I cannot blame her for this it's me you know and having I mean that that a lot of people would try and blame the kid I mean our parent a lot of our parents did she's the problem she's a problem child yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You're right. A lot of people. So good on you this. for not doing that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, first, I think that first year of just accepting, like, oh, no, this is my responsibility and this is all on me. Like, it really, and unraveling all the areas that I had blamed other people and tried to make it their fault or their responsibility to save me or help me in this. And if they only would have done this, then I'd be in a different place. Really getting to a place where I go, well, if I would have done something different, I would be in a different place. Yeah. You know? Or if I, yeah. Victim versus ownership, which I only just learned like two years ago. Yeah. 
<laughs> and it's a, it's a journey though. It's a journey. It's a, there's so much like grief and anger and sadness and like all the stuff that comes up of around letting that go, you know, of really letting go of the ability to blame other people and to look mm. outside yourself. It's like, mm. oh no, it's really, yeah. So there, there has been, and I would love, I mean, I love nothing more than talking about this stuff and helping other women and, and men, but other women through this, because it's like to get to a place where, and, and I'm sure <laughs> I can almost guarantee that because we talked about this, like today there will right. be a test. Like yeah. I can almost oh, guarantee for sure. that for I'm sure. going to have something come up where it's like, oh, really? Did you really learn that? <laughs> oh, you really think you know what you're doing? Yeah. It's your really okay. Try it. How about this? <laughs> okay. okay. Your daughter's going to do this today. Yeah. No, I'm sure that the universe, because I mean, that just happens. I would say nine times out of 10 where I'm like, oh my God, like things are going so well. And then something happens and I'm like, no, I said things were going well, you know, like, <laughs> this opportunity to be like, yeah, just practice it, you know, just keep practicing, anchoring in that things are going well, and you can handle it. You can handle it. And it will get it will get easier. It's just going to show you different areas, different places within yourself that still need attention. And like you said, it's just about practicing. The you school practice. of life. The school of life. Yeah, man. So what are you most excited about? What's the most juicy that you want to share with whoever is listening about what you're up to right now or what you're putting out or what you want to offer or anything like that? I'm excited about a lot of things right now, actually. <laughs> okay. um, no, it's true. Yeah. So the top, music, top new music. three, top three. Okay. New music is coming. Super excited about that. Where can uh, we get it? How do we listen? Spotify. Spotify. It will be on Spotify. Um, you can follow me on TikTok, the Confident Mama Club, uh, which I'll post probably everything that I do. That's a good hub that has a lot of the gentle parenting stuff, um, a lot of cycle breaker stuff, and then, you know, little side life things. So the music for sure. Um I'm gonna say what's the second one I would say books so I have a lot of children's books that I've that are in the process still we're just working on getting them illustrated and the ones that once they're illustrated and all done they'll be on Amazon and again you'll be able to find that on my TikTok I'm sure and then the third thing I would say that the mom coaching I mean that has really grown a lot and I love working with women to, you know, especially in co-parenting separately situations and working through, because I mean, I started in a very different place than I am now with the co-parenting thing. Um, and reaching the level of freedom, I feel like from, you know, the emotional stuff with that and how controlling I used to be. And, um, just, just so many, so many aspects of that, where you mm -hmm. start, you know, in a relationship that is, I want to say so many words, but not healthy, like not the healthiest relationship mm -hmm. to then growing into a space where you can almost be grateful, almost be grateful, you know, okay. for the most part about it. Yeah. I like, I those, those no, I like that. Too. That's really beautiful. And so if we find you on Instagram, namaste, is that going to lead us to all of these things? So Namaste is just like my private personal account, but the Confident Mama Club on Instagram as well. Okay. Okay. We got to list that then. All right. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That would probably be the best side. Taylor, thank you so much for pivoting last minute with the scheduling and with what podcasts we're doing. And I know I just was like, okay, we're, you're all of a sudden you're on camera and then you're like, okay, but my hair is not, you know, and so we'll just let it dry as we go. Like, thank you yeah, for, <laughs> um, you're so naturally beautiful. It, it you know, however you looked was going to be amazing. Um, but thank you for rolling with us today and, you know, and thank you for being my friend and thank you for growing yourself and showing up and showing up big for your daughter and for yourself and for the parents and the people that, and with your music, with all of your gifts, like thank you for, for giving of who you are your magic because you're so important in this world and you're so talented and we need more of you. And I appreciate you so much. And today's, uh, 
podcast episode was just filled with incredible, incredible wisdom. And I think anyone who listens can definitely um, hugely deeply benefit from a lot of the things that you shared. So I know there's so much more that you have to share in terms of your wisdom in all of your coaching and your books and your music, like um, people need to dive in to, to Taylor's world. So go <laughs> check, please go check Taylor out. And it, she is such a gift as you can tell. I love you, mama. And I can't wait to facilitate breath work for you and um, just continue being soul sisters. I love you so much. We've we've gone through lifetimes together in this one <laughs> life. I mean, and it's been a blessing to be your friend and I love you. I found a note actually from like years ago that you had sent me being like, thank you for your friendship. And I was just like, Siri's just like the best friend. Like you are an angel on earth. And I'm oh. so grateful that our paths just, I want to say, you know, coincidentally or whatever but obviously it was destined we were destined to meet that day and yeah no I'm thank you for having me on and excited for everything to come thank you I was just remembering you holding Bodhi in the rocking chair next to my bed and just you know the photos you've taken of the kids and the time you've spent with the kids and just how special it is so all right we will say goodbye to you guys and we'll see you next time. Thank you.